people a few minutes to log in. Welcome everybody. Getting on the like, Zoom call now. Start in just a minute. I, I got that sent. So check to see if you have access to it. I did see that coming through. Excellent. There it is. Great. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to all of you from the International Dyslexia Association, New England Alliance, serving Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. I'm Susan Horahan, your current president. Um, and tonight we're going to have our Read for Parents webinar featuring Dr. Lucy Hart Paulson. And she is going to be speaking on phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. Um, as a branch, we're thrilled to provide these Read for Parents webinars every other month, which focus on different IDA fact sheets and areas of interest to families and educators. The IDA fact sheets are a great tool in informing families and professionals alike on the journey of dyslexia. As many of you parents and practitioners can probably relate, Getting structured literacy instruction for students in need is more often than not a difficult journey for parents, students, and teachers. As a branch, we're honored to bring these informative sessions to you as we work to bringing structured literacy to all students in all classrooms and especially to those who struggle. So welcome. As for introductions, tonight we have Chris Riley, who will be monitoring the chat, and she'll provide valuable links to the discussion topics. Um, we'll be having your questions, you can put your questions in the chat for our questions and answers that'll come at the end. Uh, we'll, we'll try to save about 20 minutes or so for that, and we'll be facilitating the questions and answers. Uh, there is not certificate of attendance issued for these Read for Parents sessions. Um, video and resources will be posted on the IDA and NEA website within one week. A lot of people ask for those, but we need, a, we need a little bit of time and then they will be on our website. So here are some of the IDA and NEA member benefits. Um, it's a chance to connect with your community, stay informed. You get some great deals on conferences and an ability to expand your network. So I hope that you will consider joining our branch. We'd love to have you be a part of us and help serve our mission. Um, as you can see from this slide, there are quite a few different um, membership categories. So I'm sure you can find one that is closely related to what your needs are. Check them out, hope you can join us. Some of the benefits um, that, we, that we provide is uh, this Read for Parents program. We also have a coll collaboration with Wilson twice a year, usually February and December. Uh, we are gonna be having our annual two-day conference, virtual, the end of October. And we put out a newsletter in February and August, and sometimes a smaller newsletter um, in between those. And we do offer scholarships for our conference and other events. So check it out. And now it's with great pleasure that I will introduce Dr. Lucy Hart Paulson. Uh, she is an author and literacy specialist with a mission of bringing research to practice. She is also a speech language pathologist with many years of experience working with educators and with young children and their families in a wide range of educational settings. In addition, Lucy was an associate professor teaching and conducting research in the areas of language and literacy development and disorders. She provides professional development using a broad-based perspective, blending areas of language and literacy together, resulting in effective, appropriate, and engaging language-based literacy instruction and intervention for all children. Finally, Lucy is the co-author of the Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling, better known as Letters Training, for Early Childhood Educators, second edition, Building Early Literacy and Language Skills, a resource and activity guide for young children and for good talking words, second edition, a social communication skills program for young children. Wow. 
a lot of a lot of accomplishments there. So welcome so much, and thank you for being here with us. And I will turn it over to you. All right. There we go. Can you see my screen? All right. You can. Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to share information related to phonological awareness. I'm really honored to have an opportunity to spend this time with you. And uh, it's one of my favorite topics. It's one that that uh, surely was a was a, a big contribution to my own research agenda uh, when I got to participate in that kind of capacity. And so what I thought we could do today was talk about, or this evening for you, uh, phonemic awareness, talk about some facts, and how about a little bit of fun? Um, how about that? And so as you heard, I'm an author. I'm, I uh, am a speech and language pathologist by profession, and I have been doing that for decades and decades and decades and decades and decades. And I know a lot about, or I mean, I, I bet I can... Uh, empathize with a lot of the stories that you have as a uh, as as an educator in providing services for students as they're learning to read and write and students when that reading and writing process has been a struggle and for you family members who have been in that uh, learning process with your children and the the challenges that they have had and I will say that this notion of phonological um, processing, phonological and phonemic awareness, in my mind, is the kernel of how oral language begins to develop and the kernel of how reading and writing develop. And for a lot of us, I have a little bit of brain the, um, information that I want to share about, but for a lot of us, when reading doesn't work as well as we want it to, there's some difference in the architectural structure of our brain. So anyway, welcome to all of you and thank you so much for your interest and your participation in these kinds of things. And so I can say hello from the Oregon branch of IDA as I get to be a member of the, uh, the Oregon branch. And here's a sunset for what I get to look at. Lovely volcanoes, that's what those actually are, these peaks volcanoes in, uh, in where, where I get to see. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is take out a piece of paper, scratch, scratch piece of paper or pencil, and I have some queries for you before we get started. And just take a little notion of uh, and check in of your own phonological and phonemic awareness understanding. Okay, you ready? We have five queries for you. The first one is true or false. Phonological awareness requires alphabet letters. True or false? Okay. Number two, which do young children learn to manipulate or play with first? Do they learn to play with syllables in words or do they learn to play with sounds in words? Syllables first or sounds first? Okay. How about this one, number three? How many speech sounds are in the word fix? Okay, and number four, how many speech sounds are in the word catch? And then the last one is a pretty specific one, and it is the phonological awareness skill of children leaving preschool, pre-kindergarten, going into kindergarten that is strongly related to a child's ability to read at the end of second grade going into third grade. What is that very specific phonological awareness skill that is that predictive of later literacy learning. All right, so let's see how you did. Okay, true or false? Phonological awareness, does it require alphabet letters? I hope you said false. Nope, you can close your eyes and in essence, you can do phonological awareness in the dark. That doesn't mean that we do it in the dark, but it is a very specific skill in and of itself, and I'll share a little bit more with you um, in a couple of slides coming along. All right, what do young children learn to do first? Play with syllables or play with sounds? And I hope you said syllables. Those are a larger unit of language and a more uh, purposeful unit of language 
within the rhythmic nature of how language sounds. Okay, fix. How many speech sounds? The first sound is sh. The second sound is e. Eh. The third sound is careful. And the final sound is s. I. S. All right. So four sounds there. And how about catch? How many speech sounds in catch? E. Ch. Three sounds there. All right. And here is that very best predictive indicator of how well a young child's literacy learning is developing that would predict how well they're reading at the end of second grade or so. And it is their ability to identify the initial sound in words. You have a cup. What does cup start with? They say C. Mm, that's the letter. What's the sound that it makes? A really important distinction between letters and sounds, but a very important skill in the process of learning to read and write. Okay, so here are some things I'd like to share with us in our short time together this evening. I want to talk about some facts about phonological and phonemic awareness. What do we know? I want to talk about some phonological awareness developmental trends and then share some things that we can do that are going to help build those skills in young children and what happens when it's not developing in ways that we would like. What are some intervention strategies that we can consider? All right, so here's our brain and it's the left side of your brain. So put your hand on the left side of your brain and we have these areas in our brain that help us know uh, that develop and that connect when we learn how the alphabet system is mapped to the sound system of our language and we call that written language. And so way in the back of our brain, put your left hand in the back part of your brain, that's where it's in your occipital lobe, it's your visual processing system, and it's where your orthographic processor is. What's an orthographic processor? It's spelling, it's how written language looks. So you see how letters go together in patterns in words, and that's one of the very first connections to the reading process. You see it, and then the next piece that I want to talk about, so up here, put your hand right behind your ear, that is the meaning processor. That's where your oral language comprehension lives, your understanding of how language lives. It's called Wernicke's area, and it's about meaning. And then put your hand up here, almost at your temple. And that is called Broca's area. And that's where phonological production lives. You think about, oh, I have, uh, I'm looking at the letter M. Mm, what sound does that represent? And what your brain just did, even though you didn't say that, or you may not have said that sound, but what your brain represented was, oh, your lips need to go together and that sound comes out your nose. Mm. That's speech production, articulation, along with some cohesion and synthesizing of oral language. All right, so that's the, you see it, you develop meaning, and then you know how to pronounce those words that you are reading. Here's the speaking part of it. And now I wanna share with you a really, really important element, component of our brain that connects, where's the meaning processor? behind your ear, and where's the production processor? Up here. And so there's this band of neurons that connect meaning and production. It's called the arcuate fasciculus. You say it? Arcuate fasciculus. You say it a few times, practice saying it, and put a little jingle in it. That's what you're doing when you're playing with syllables. Arcuate fasciculus. Mm -hmm. That's a really important aspect of literacy learning. And there's good research that Nadine Gabb is doing in her Gabb lab at Harvard, looking at infants as young as four months of age who live in a family where there is someone already diagnosed in that family who has dyslexia and comparing the brain structure of babies to that of babies where there is no known uh, dyslexia in the family because we know that there is an inherit an in, uh, inheritable inheritable connection about fifty to sixty percent increased 
chance of developing dyslexia. And what she's identified in these babies as young as four months of age so far, those are the youngest babies, is a difference in the architectural structure of this phonological processor. What's that called? The arcuate fasciculus. Now, there's a physical, physiologic and neurologic difference in those babies' brains. And as those children have grown older, and there's a longitudinal study that goes along with that, figure out seeing what that results in. Now, on the other side of that, I want to say two things. Number one, when we have an opportunity when children are little, before they have an opportunity or before they get into a situation where they're going to fail or really struggle at learning to read and write, we can help build really strong phonological awareness uh, foundations so we can smooth out that road to reading. Now, if that road to reading has already been a struggle, I also want to say, here's my second point, it's never too late to help build those underlying foundations so that that reading and writing process can be a little bit smoother. Okay, so arcuate fasciculus. And then there's this area right before, be, behind the word form area, which connects the visual, the orthographic processor, the meaning processor, and a connection to the arcuate, arcuate fasciculus. And that's the word form area. And that's where our orthographic mapping takes place, where you see a word and you recognize it so quickly that you don't have to sound it out anymore. But what your brain has done is connected all of those pieces, pronounced it front and back, and told you what that word is. You are attending to every single letter of every single word, and your brain is processing the phonological aspects of what that word is when you are reading. Now, here's a really important, uh, some important points. Let's see. The arcuate fasciculus develops, it matures between about 18 and 24 months. Think about a toddler to a two-year-old and what is happening with their language vocabulary is exploding and in order, order to say new words, they have to add more speech sounds to their repertoire in order to make those words more understandable. So the phonologic system is well in place and working really hard. And another aspect of the angular gyrus and see if this matches up with some of your experience. Those of you who get to work with a range of children. According to some of the neurologic research is the angular gyrus is one of the last parts of the brain to functionally and anatomically mature. And capacities that this part of the brain mediates include reading, calculation, so there's some math aspects and elements, performing reversible options in space, you know, seeing how something, if you're going to, if you're using a map and you have north going always to the front, but you happen to be going south, you have to know that reverse orientation. And the angular gyrus develops typically in children between the ages of five to about eight. How many of you know five-year-olds who learned how to read? Mm -hmm. How many know eight-year-olds who kind of struggled with that reading process through kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and then all of a sudden something clicked and on down the road, they, they got it. And it could be that their angular gyrus came on board. It connected neurologically to those parts of the brain that need to be wired together for reading and writing to take place. Now, Marianne Wolf says there are some kids whose angular gyrus develops at about four. Those kids who figure out what that reading process is precociously. And then on the other side of that, what her research has identified, neurologic research, is that there are some kids where it doesn't develop until about age nine. So a big, wide range. But one of the things that I love from the neurologists that I've had an opportunity to interact with, um, Bennett Shaywitz said this, you know what teachers can do that neuroscientists cannot? And teachers, meaning educators, like many of you, teachers who are parents who are working with your children, you know what you can do that neurologists can't? You can change brains. 
So with really good instruction, we can help build those connections between the occipital and meaning and production and phonologic processing systems that will make a really important foundation for learning to read and write. So see how that matches up with your understanding. Okay, I wanna have just another little ponder and see what you think about these terms and your understanding of what these terms are. And I wanna just share a little bit about these terms uh, because there's this big, really important picture of phonological processing that includes phonological and phonemic awareness. And they're important pieces that come together, certainly interconnected, but they have a unique element that adds to the construction of somebody's phonological processing system. So what's your familiarity with these terms? How do you feel about the term of the difference between what is phonological awareness, what is phonemic awareness? What do you feel about the terms of phonological naming, phonological retrieval, recoding? Okay, how about the term phonological working memory? How about this term, phonological sensitivity? How about this one, phonological representation? All right, let's have a little chat about that and we can see what it is that you understand, go a little deeper or maybe clarify uh, and expand understanding of what this bigger notion is. So this is a graph that's out of letters for early childhood educators. Um, and when we talk about this notion of phonological processing, and in the research that Joe Torgerson has done across decades, he, uh, another con con contributor is uh, Chris Lonigan. So we've known for a while, and here's how Torgerson describes phonological processing. There are three component skills that come together that are intertwined. One of them is phonological awareness. The second one is phonological naming. A third one is phonological working memory. And so let's look at those definitions. You all know the definition of phonological awareness. Our ability to intentionally manipulate or play with parts of words, parts of speech. When it is a syllable, it's a bigger notion. When it's a sound, it's a smaller notion. And that is what phonemic awareness is. So I like to talk about phonological awareness as being rhyme awareness as being syllable awareness and phoneme awareness. Those three component skills that we, that we uh, tune into and develop a capacity to play with rhymes, play with syllables, and play with speech sounds. Okay, the next one is phonological naming. And phonological naming is our ability to pull up a word that we're trying to think about. Now, the retrieval piece of it is one that I know every single one of you probably has had a little glitch now and then. And here is a great example. How many of you have called one little friend by somebody else's name? Right? They're your own kids calling them the pet's name or calling one little friend by somebody else's name. Yeah, your word, you had a little glitch with your word retrieval, retrieving the word that you really wanted to say. Okay, so that's what retrieval is, pulling up words quickly that you want to, that you want to know about or that, you, that you're thinking about or wanting to say. And here's what recoding is. Okay, here's a Here's a complicated, well, here's the easy one. Uh, give me a word, say a word that rhymes with the word boat. How many of you said goat or note or loat? Lots of different words. So what you had to do was take the word boat and recode it so that it had a different beginning sound. That's what phonological recoding is. And it's related to phonological naming. Okay, here's the next one, phonological working memory. So that's how many things we can keep in mind at the same time. Easy enough, okay? 
It's short term and it's temporary. All right, so those three components of awareness, naming, and memory, or awareness, naming, and memory create the capacity for us to hear and understand and use language from an oral perspective, as well as from a written language perspective. All right, so now underneath all of that is this term of phonological representation. I see a lot more conversation about that term, this particular term now in the literature than I have seen over the past several decades. Phonological representation is how you have words stored in your head. So here's an example of that. Think of your the name uh, or uh, think of the name of your mother, your mother's name. Can you hear your mother's name inside your head even though you're not saying it out loud? Mm -hmm. That is your phonological representation. And I would submit that when kids are not able to pull up words or when literacy, when literacy is hard, when oral language might be challenging, there probably is some kind of underdevelopment in the phonological um, representation. Okay, let's do a bit of another word recoding. And what type of a skill is recoding? It's a phonological naming task. Mm -hmm. Say the word tiger. Say it again, but don't say the g sound. And you came up with the word tire. So what you just did in that task is you used all three of those components. You had to hold the word uh, tiger in your short-term working memory. And then with your phonological awareness skills, you had to extract the phoneme g. And then you had to recode the word tiger into the word tire. And so phonological awareness is the skill that we can teach, but it relies on phonological naming and phonological working memory. All right. So phonological representation is all related to that, to those pieces. And phonological representation, another term that we can use for that is inner speech. So it's the it's how words or the pronunciation of words are stored. It has a whole lot to do with vocabulary. Here's a little friend. This happened to me in a clinical setting. The little friend came to see me for his speech therapy session. And, and uh, the dad shared this story. He said, I want to make the alligator go up. So word, what word does, was he trying to say? Elevator. Which word did he have stored phonologically? Alligator. He didn't have elevator stored yet. And so he came up with something that was, that was kind of close. So think about the students, the children that are in your care. Have you ever heard them say something that was just a little bit off? Like saying a bailable? My granddaughter called him when she was three, she said, is grandpa available? <laughs> or uh, Paschetti, I think the best one I ever heard, four-year-old saying odor arm deodorant. Yeah. Okay, so that's phonological representation. Inner speech, how you hear words inside your head, which then helps you to retrieve them. And then here's a definition that I like to use from uh, about phonological sensitivity. Now, being a speech therapist, I have had a very important uh, an interest in speech development. And I love the definition that this group of different researchers have used. And phonological sensitivity is that time period between uh, infants and toddlers, as they are listening to the sounds and the words that they are bathed in, and then they begin to play with and use those sounds. They become sensitive to it, to speech sounds, to syllable patterns, and word boundaries. And so this little friend is saying, donatar, donatar, right? Looks like about a two-year-old. Is that okay for a two-year-old? Yeah, he's getting some of the speech sounds and the rhythm of that sentence or that phrase. Not so good for a little, for a four or five-year-old little friend. 
But one of the things we know about phonological sensitivity is that it's also related to rhyme sensitivity. And so as children are learning to say more words, they have to under, they have to hear, become sensitive to how words sound the same and how they sound different so they can differentiate their uh, their vocabulary as they're saying more and more words. And we know that phonological processing of sounds, this phonological sensitivity begins well before babies are even born. Babies in utero or premature babies born up to three months premature and some research that's conducted on those babies even that in that sensitive time period, they can recognize syllables in human speech. So this little friend, she has a cat a, or a hat and it's in the shape of a cat. Two very important words to her. And so in order for her to know the distinction between how you pronounce those words, she has to become sensitive to the distinction of what those words sound like. Now, it's also a really important element for second language learners or a more contemporary term multilingual students that we have who are learning another language and English as another language. <clears throat> we know that there's a well-documented, pretty well-documented silent stage where children are, or, or learners are listening to the sounds and the syllable patterns and the word boundaries in that language that they are learning to acquire. How many of you have tried to learn a, uh, another language as an adult? easy or hard? And I know what you're saying. You're saying, that was hard. And when you hear a native speaker of that language, what does it sound like? <sighs> so fast, because you have not had the opportunity to become phonologically sensitive to the syllables, the sounds, the word boundaries of that new language. So that's, you know, another really important phonological connection. So we're going to quickly do this. How about a little friend who says it's, is this phonological sensitivity or is it phonological representation? A child saying, it's hard for me to rememorize. Putting two words together, right? Remember and memorize, that's representation. A little friend who's a young child saying, I wiped a wet one. That's phonological sensitivity. There are speech sounds that have not become as sensitive as, uh, as they will at some point. How about a little, oh, here, I gave this one away. Uh, it's grandpa a bay level, <laughs> right? Representation, not quite sure how to say available when you're pretty little. How about this one? Uh, calling a television remote a marote. Yep, getting those sounds. The sensitivity is still developing, but that's that representation of how that word is supposed to sound. And how about this one? A little friend who says one, two, three, four. Now, it might be sensitivity or representation, depending on what a dialect might be. All right. So I hope you have a deeper connection to what those, uh, those pH terms sound like. The difference between phonological and phonemic awareness, phonological representation, sensitivity, uh, phonological uh, naming, and working memory. So let's chat quickly about some developmental trends. And in the nature, we can teach phonological awareness. We can't really teach phonological naming or phonological working memory. Those are good assessment tools to identify how a child's phonological processing is developing but we can teach phonological awareness. And in building stronger foundations in phonological awareness, that has spillover effects to enhance and improve phonological working memory and phonological naming. Okay, so in the area of phonological awareness, we have two different component skills. One, a rhyme, a rhyming, and one, a blending and segmenting. And you'll see I put alliteration in connected with blending and segmenting. Often it's connected with rhyme, but in a little friend's perspective, when you do a rhyme activity and an alliteration or first sound activity together, it is way confusing for little friends. But when you're doing alliteration, it is a first sound activity, and that is what segmentation entails. Okay, so 
Why is this important? So blending, when you take something that's pulled apart, put it together, is important for phonetic or for phonic decoding. When you want to read, you're going to sound out words and you got to be able to squeeze those sounds together to be able to read what the word is. It is a phonologically based skill. And segmenting is an analysis. Let's see, what are the sounds in this particular word? And it's critical for spelling. It's also really important for rapid sight word recognition and orthographic mapping. Okay, David Kilpatrick helped give us this sequence progression of phonological awareness in the big bird's eye view and identifying early phonological awareness, basic phonological awareness and complex phonological awareness. And when we look at early phonological awareness, look at what the age range is, toddlers to young preschoolers. And the focus from blending and segmenting is on syllables and rhyme detection. Do those sound the same? Or giggling when you read a book that has some funny rhymes in it because you can hear what that sounds like. Not really sure what it is yet, but it's a detection. And then preschool, particularly that pre-K year, kinder, first grade, is when phonemic awareness is going to be a really important instructional level. It's about phonemes, blending and segmenting at that level. From a rhyme perspective, it shifts from just hearing it and recognizing it to more of a production. Now I can say words that rhyme. And then complex phonological awareness. And this requires mostly the complex manipulations like adding, substituting, deleting, reversing word segments. Those are harder. They require more working memory and they are supported by the development of learning to read. I'll share with you what I mean about that in just a minute. Okay, so in that earliest time period, there's a lot of exposure to wordplay. And then in that basic level, there should be a lot of instruction as those skills are developing. And we wanna make sure that children have a strong foundation in those skills. And then when it's not developing very well, we need to move to an intervention level to build that important phonologic foundation. Okay, now I wanna share with you a pretty complicated table. This also comes from Letters for Early Childhood Educators. In looking at those two different component skills of blending and segmenting and rhyming. Now, blending and segmenting is going to include phonemic awareness. Sometimes rhyme does. Uh, it, rhyme is, is a, a different kind of uh, connection. What we want to really focus on is a lot of blending and segmenting, although rhyme has a contribution as well. Okay, so from a developmental perspective and um, from a rhyming perspective, okay, rhyming perspective, young children are exposed to a lot of rhymes, hopefully in the books and the songs that they're experiencing. So they hear a lot of it, build that detection, and then they're able to match if words sound the same at the end or not, and then be able to produce sounds uh, or words that have a rhyme to it. All right, with blending and segmenting, the first children, our young children, are able to play with words at a syllable level, both blending and segmenting. And then they're able to play with words to a single sound level. And you see specifically where there is some phonemic awareness understanding. So do these words sound the same at the end or of, at the end? Bat cat, you had to hear a difference in that initial sound, but then think if those words sounded the same at the end from a rhyme perspective. And then from a blending and segmenting perspective, hearing a beginning sound, and that's what alliteration is. Let's see how many of, you know, a little kid in pre-K whose name is Sarah, and she hears and recognizes that her friend Sam sounds just like her name at the beginning. So it's alliteration and there's a detection first. And generally it's a detection of sounds that are at the beginning of a word. 
then kids can turn tune into sounds at the ends of words and then we move into that next piece of the being able to identify what the initial sound is in words and then the final sound in words and that's what a term that we can use the word onset okay and then in a progression moving to all the sounds in simple words and think about a cvc word or a word that has a consonant a vowel and a consonant which are very common words in um, english like the word fish or house ish and that is expected at the end of kindergarten if i back up in this ability to identify the initial sound in words Remember what that very best indicator of children leaving pre-K, going into kindergarten, and how well they'll be reading in second grade? There is that particular, there's that skill right there. Okay, by the end of first grade, we want children to be able to identify sounds that are in a little bit more complex word, like a, a word that has two consonants together, then a vowel, and then another consonant, like the word stop, or consonants that are at the end of a word like in fast with the st at the end and then what happens are some manipulations where children can add either add no here's a word add a sound to it here uh here's a word delete when we did tiger we did a deletion um a substitution switching sounds around okay so let's add some layers to this one of the things that that uh, kilpatrick really uh emphasizes is that you want these manipulations to be proficient. You can do them pretty readily so that when you are hearing or trying to read a word and it didn't quite sound ex correct, you gotta you can flex it a little bit. And what you're you doing is using your phonological awareness skills to flex, to flex a sound in that particular word, the pronunciation, so that you can come up with a word that makes sense within that the um, passage that you're reading. Okay, so here's some layers. When we look at though that big bird's eye view, early in uh, toddlers and young preschoolers, and then at the sound level is at that basic level. And then as students are learning how to read, it moves into that complex or advanced level. And then we have these words by syllables and then moving into a, a first sound in preschool into pre-K, and then words by sound, absolutely a big, big focus in kindergarten and first grade needs to be on phonemes, not on syllables, but on phonemes. And then beyond that, the manipulations are going to be on first grade and beyond. And then we add another layer to this. In preschool, it's about exposure. In late uh, pre-K, kinder, first grade, that basic level, it's about instruction. Let's build really strong foundations. And then when that doesn't build, when that foundation is not very solid, then we need to move into intervention. Okay, so let me put another, so I see where we're at here. I want to put just another quick spin on our connection to the timeline of literacy development. So we have infant or, you know, toddlers and preschoolers with early literacy into early reading and writing when kindergarten, first, second grade, when that reading and writing process is really developing. And then that next transition of reading to learn. And so we have these before any alphabetic understanding, early alphabetic, and then later alphabetic and consolidated. If you're familiar with Linnea Aries phases of word reading and spelling. And in that pre-alphabetic phase, it's tuning into the sounds of language, that phonological sensitivity, then moving into phonological awareness. And it's a, a visual processing is the is the primary source of, of written language in that phase. And then phonological processing is developing along with letter recognition and writing. And then in the later alphabetic phase, mapping letters and sounds, reading and writing simple words, and reading in connected language and connected text, and then moving into that big shift from reading, uh, reading to learn and written compositions. Now, let's take those and put another kind of connection together. In those earliest years, toddler preschoolers are building phonological awareness and think about blue, okay? They also 
are learning about letters. Think about red. And then when they have enough phonological phonemic awareness foundation and they have enough letter knowledge, they blend those two things together and that is what the alphabetic principle is. Here's a letter, it is the letter M. What sound does it spell? Mmm. And what does blue and red make together? Purple. Okay, and then as phonological awareness continues to develop, phonemic awareness continues to develop, when you have the capacity to visualize a word because you are learning to read the orthographic map of what words look like, you have that ability to then contribute to your phonological or phonemic manipulation tasks. And that's where basic and advanced manipulations come into play. Phonics is full on purple. It requires uh, phonological awareness and it requires alphabet knowledge. I'm getting kind of old and I'm getting a little bit snarky. And here's one of my snarkinesses. Do you know what phonics is without phonological awareness? It's onyx. You can't just have letter knowledge if you want to learn how to write. You have to have well-defined phonemic awareness. Okay, so in the earliest years, it's visual symbols. And then in the later years, it's the sound to symbol. All right, so I am been, I've been talking way too much. We know that some of the precursors to literacy or to dyslexia, we can see in phonological awareness. Look at all, look at how much of these indicators relate to phonological processing. Phonological awareness, rapid automatized naming, that's word retrieval, verbal working memory, phonological working memory, letter knowledge, oral vocabulary. A lot of them. Uh, connect to those important aspects of phonological processing. So I want to, um, there's a, a great study that Hugh Katz did looking at the early identifiers of, of uh, dyslexia, what should be in a universal screen at the beginning of kindergarten, letter name fluency, that's a retrieval, that's word naming, letter uh, phonemic awareness, rapid naming, non-word repetition, all of those are related to phonological uh, processing. Okay, so let's see, here we go. So again, here's that strongest predictor of later literacy learning as we've talked about. Phonemic awareness, that sa initial sound isolation and letter name knowledge. Okay, so there's some strat or some development. Let's go over some strategies. And you have a handout that has all of these on it. And I want to, I know there's going to be a lot of words on this slide, but think about the foundation skills that are required for phonological awareness to develop. Children need to have oral language, one-to-one -one correspondence, being able to follow directions, understand directionality, awareness of speech sounds. And what's listed here for you or what the phonological awareness skills are that children need at different ages and grade levels, and then how that's going to connect to what phonics and word recognition is. So you can see that from a preschool level, how it expands and develops into kindergarten, what phonological awareness looks like in kindergarten and what are some expectations, and then what are expectations in that uh, phonics and word recognition and then moving into first grade. And remember when the basic level of phonological awareness is complete or is expected to be complete by the end of first grade. So what can we do? So in that big picture, look at all of these skills that come about as a result of building and growing, developing phonological awareness. So rhyming, blending, segmenting, manipulating, letter sound knowledge, orthographic mapping, decoding, high frequency words, root words and suffixes. There's so much to that foundation of the phoneme and phonology that contribute to oral and written language. All right, so here are some routines. Here are some routines that we can use when we're working with young children related to rhyme. So we can rhyme children's names when taking attendance or when dismissing them from circle. 
we can change the beginning sound in children's names, which is a manipulation task. Who's here today? Terry Berry, Chris Biss, Jalen Chalen. We can give directions that change words in our direction to a rhyming word, like it's time to go to a bri to the bribery. You do that with little kids when they know what the routine is supposed to be, and they're going to, no, it's not the bribery, it's a library. And what have they just done? Recognized that there was a word there that didn't sound correct and replaced it with the, the word that should be there. And point out the rhymes, intentionally point out words in uh, songs and books, finger plays, that rhyme. Flopsy Mopsy, did you hear that Flopsy Mopsy rhyme? How about Cottontail? No, Cottontail doesn't rhyme. And so many more. When you get into uh, kinder uh, first grade, change the sound to the corresponding letter and letter sound that uh, is being highlighted. Instead of Chris, Mris or uh, Mavid, who's here? Mavid, who's here? Mon, Molly. You do want to pay attention to what children's names turn, turn into <laughs> when you do this activity, particularly if you're working on a, the letter B or the letter F, and depending on what the children's names are in your, in your uh, group. Okay, yes, check out what your children's names tune into. You can use an alphabet chart and have children give you a rhyming word that goes along with it. So here is rope. And I have an ABCI chart that I use, uh, have a conversation about. Sometimes I have one that I've circled the vowels so we don't have, we can just skip the vowels. Okay, rope, what's this one gonna be? Rope, bope, cope, dope, vowel. Fope, gope, hope, jope, cope, and go through all of the letters in the alphabet. And then you can add, oh, is that a real word? Is that a, a, a make-believe word or a pretend word? Okay, create a chart that has the phonetic patterns that you're teaching and then create a string of rhyming words and non-words. Lots of things that we can do. So many. There's an example of the ABCI chart, circle the vowels because you can skip over those. All right, or here are those word families, right? How many different words can we come up with? Look at how the spelling, uh, how that spelling pattern looks. Okay, uh, blending, okay, let's shift to blending and segmenting and here are some hints. When you do blending and segmenting activities, have a gesture that you use that is associated with it. I love this word, it's called a kinem. A kinem is a gesture that connects to a concept. So motions, when I do syllables, I like to start at my wrist and tap up my joints. Kangaroo, Hel uh, helicopter, bigger movements for syllables. And then when I get to phonemes, I like to use my fingers. You can pull those sounds together into the word. <clears throat> you also wanna highlight the mouth gesture. What does your mouth do when you say at? Oh, let's say, Oh, cat. Mm -hmm. Now let's change the first sound k to b. Now what does your mouth do? And when you segment sounds, this is say phonological awareness in the dark, right? Not letter sounds, and it's different for letter blending when you are reading. But you want to have one, about one second intervals between the syllables or between the sounds. And that's where a gesture or a kinem can help to pace you. All right, shorten that, that uh, pause to make it easier. Expand the pause to make it a little harder because it taxes phonological working memory. So if kids are getting it and they need more of a challenge. That's one of the things that we can do to help provide that challenge. All right, make sure that you're saying the sounds in the words and not the letter names, and make sure that you are saying the sounds in their parity. If you're saying the sounds in fish, you can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Do you say fa, i, sh? No. Then you have a fa, isha. You say f, i, sh. Yes. Okay. Syllables we know are easier than sounds. And in that progression of a word, beginning sounds are easiest, followed by final sounds and then middle sounds, as we saw on that, that table that, that I shared with you. All right, 
And consonant blends are harder. Two consonants together are harder from a developmental perspective when young children are learning to talk with their articulation. And they're harder as children are learning to segment the sounds in words. Okay, so routines. Pickety pickety bumblebee, please say your name for me. We have a song card and an alphabet, or a song card and a, and a bee puppet. And you can clap the sounds in children's names. Who's here today? Lucy or Lucy, Jennifer, Susan, Chris, mm -hmm. Andrea. Um, you can have children segment and blend the syllables or the sounds in new vocabulary words, helping to cement the phonological representation of those new words. You can use a balance scale like this little friend in kindergarten. It's a kindergarten um, center activity with a balance scale and counters and pictures. And you take two pictures, you compare which word uh, weighs more, helicopter or piano. So you put, Let's see, helicopter, four, piano, three. You put those counters into the balance scale and then you can see which word weighs more. Um, I spy games or a magic mirror where you look around the room and find things that might begin with a particular sound or uh, have two syllables or whatever concept it is that you are working on, whatever that goal is for children as, as uh, they are developing these skills. Lots of things that we can do. And then another uh, routine for young children when this is developing is to um, take pictures and create picture puzzles with them. Guess what I have? I have a vol hey no. What do you think? Vol K no. Put it together and pull it apart. So a great center time activity, a great small group, whole group activity. And it's so visual that children can see it. So you can do that with syllables. You can do it with initial sound, rest of the word. And you can make picture puzzles that are individual speech sounds. So one caveat to this, you'll see that I have the letters on the picture puzzles here. And that is good when children are in the developmental phase of this. When you are working with students and you're beyond the developmental phase, you're beyond the exposure and the instruction phase, and you've moved into the intervention phase, there's probably a very strong chance that a student at the intervention phase is having has some underdeveloped phonological processing uh, issue. And so what you want to do is build the phonological processing system without the support of letters. So if you're doing this with older students and I've done it a lot and very successfully, but do not put the letters on um, the picture puzzles that you might make for older students, block those out. Okay, so some routines, let's see where we're at. Some routines for older students, you can see what those are, focus on phonemes in kindergarten, first grade, progressively move from easier words to more complex words. Uh, lots of things that you can do with sorting, uh, making phonemic connections to letter patterns. Here's what the word sounds like. What does the word look like? And we can do that with Elkonin boxes. We can do it with activities of say it, tap it, uh, write it, right? Say it, say bit, b it. Map that out. Now, what are the sounds that go along with that word, uh, and you can do word chain activities, say tap, t, app. Now change tap to top. Oh, what do we have to do? T, oh, change the middle sound. Now say top and change it to hop. Oh, that was the beginning sound. Say hop, okay? Now say hot. That was the final sound. So those kinds of activities where children are keying into what the sounds are. Now, for kids who aren't getting it, when you don't have a, a well-established phonemic awareness in kindergarten, first grade, then students struggling with this process, with this these skill sets, 
should receive a comprehensive phonological processing evaluation to determine what is happening within that phonologic system. And if phonemic awareness skills are underdeveloped, then activities, again, should not include letters because you want to build up. You want to make those connections to uh, those brain processes so that arcuate fasciculus is smoothly helping to move between uh, meaning and pronunciation. Okay, so complex awareness we can delete syllables, you can uh, which can add to what morphemes are in that morphology realm. Addition, where you add a sound. Uh, substitution, where you switch sounds around. Reversals, where you might say pat and say switch the sounds and say tap. Lots of word manipulations and play and we want it to become pretty automatic and proficient so it doesn't take too much time so i am running out of time because i see there are a lot of questions and i want to make sure we leave some time for that so here in your handout here are some things that we can do to provide a scaffold when children are struggling with the rhyming process what can we do and one of the things i think is so valuable is some kind of listening device, a whisper phone. All this is is PVC and two elbows. And what this does is it just makes the sound go into your ear a little bit louder. It activates and facilitates that auditory system. Um, and as a speech therapist, it's a tool that, that I can't uh, not have. Um, I also have headphones so that for students who are more in that tier two and tier three level, you have headphones that go to both ears. So you're getting that cross intervention. There are also things that we can do to when students are getting it and, and uh, we wanna go to the next level. Similar, similar kinds of things for rhyming and blending, uh, uh, for rhyming, uh, uh, blending and segmenting as they are for rhyming. Um, so we have those. So an important skill, and why this is so important is because we want children to read fluently. And that is when you look at a word, you recognize it instantly. It's almost as if you're seeing it by sight, but because it's so automatic, you have mapped the sounds to that letter pattern That's what, or, uh, so efficiently that you recognize that word fairly automatically. And in order for that to take place, you need good oral language development, Absolutely, phonemic segmentation and blending, proficient phoneme grapheme correspondences, and proficient phonemic awareness with manipulation tasks. So we got through all of these topics. I hope I shared some things that deepened your understanding, maybe clarified some things, maybe have some things spinning around, but I hope that it's something that will make a difference in the realm that you have an influence for and making a difference for the students who are in our care. So thank you so much for who you are and what you do and what you represent. And also thank you for participating in this session. Thank you so much there. As you know, there are lots of questions coming in. We are so excited. Everyone has like questions from early, early childhood over into like you start to talk about the older students who, um, you know, still have sort of underdeveloped phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. So, um, and it's never too late to build it. All right. So um, one of the questions was, um, do you know of anyone who can review a child's phonological awareness weakness, giving slow growth and make suggestions for intervention? So, so do I know? Anyone who do you know of anyone who can review a child's phonological awareness weaknesses given slow growth and make suggestions for intervention? Kind of as a referral in a local or region? Maybe I'm not sure. I just yeah. Mm -hmm. We have we have really good long-standing data on what a typical three-year-old should be doing, what a young four-year-old should be doing, what a four and a half-year-old should be doing, what a five-year-old going into kindergarten should be doing, what a kinder five to six-year-old should be doing. So we have really good information there. And there are some really uh, valuable assessment tools that are designed for young children to get an idea 
of how their own phonological uh, awareness skills are developing. Um, it's a little harder to see what their phonological retrieval is and what phonological working memory is, because when you're pretty little, those are still skill sets that are developing a lot. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of development that's happening. So um, I guess if there were, if, if you wanted to have, if the person asking the question wanted to have some of those resources, I surely could provide some of those tools. But I bet your speech and language pathologist in the area or the region would know what they are also. Um, this one person says, and what is the earliest age a child can learn reading? Is there an age where a child is too young to learn how to read? Oh, that's a that's an interesting question and a good one. So I like to think about reading from a developmental perspective. And a cartoon that I have in letters is a little kid uh, reading a book, and he says, "Look, I can read the pictures." Mm -hmm. Is that a perfect definition for reading when you're three? Yes, I will say from a more specific context. When you would think about reading as looking at a a word looking at what the letters are in that word and mapping the sounds that that uh, those letters or the graphemes are supposed to represent. That notion of a sound is a pretty abstract concept. And in multiple studies that I did, looking at what three-year-olds can do, what four-year-olds can do, what five-year-olds can do from a lot of developmental research that I conducted, I saw a very interesting trend at four and a half to five. So I always I always dis disaggregated the data to look at, okay, what do young three-year-olds do? What do three and a half-year-olds do? What do four-year-olds do? Four and a half-year-olds, five, five and a half. So go by half years. And there were such, there was such an interesting connection across multiple studies at a leap in learning when it, a, a, in, a, in a children's ability to attend to a phoneme at four and a half to five, which was not present. That ability was not present in four to four and a half year olds. And so true reading is when you can phonologically map the sounds to the graphemes. Now, some children that I worked with, and maybe some of you work with kids who are on the autism spectrum. I worked with a lot of kids who are hyperlexic and they could read a lot of words. They figured out that visual connection, that visual pattern to how words work, but they really had really poor, poor comprehension of what it was that they were reading. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. Um, one of the next question is, how do we support or do you have any suggestions for interventions for a, um, a child who's over 10, who's still struggling with those uh, phonological awareness and phonemic awareness deficits in the medial and ending sounds? Uh -huh. The so parent, like what, what do they do? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would. So if that child was referred to me, I would do a, uh, a pretty well, a comprehensive literacy evaluation that would include phonological processing to see where the breakdown is. Is it a breakdown? And when you're 10, you can identify differences between phonological awareness uh, retrieval, word naming or word retrieval, and working memory to see where that phonological system is not working as well for that friend. And then there are a number of programs that are available that drill down and help to teach those skills. Um, there's a bit of controversy about that in the field today. Um, my own experience in working with a number of older students diagnosed with dyslexia struggling with the reading process and going right back down to that, those bottom, the, those uh, real important phonemic awareness skills, building that skill set, matching it up to, matching it to the letter patterns and then moving into morphemes. Successful in helping to uh, teach children to, those students to read and write. Actually, they weren't kids anymore. They were college students. Um, this is definitely a question about, can exposing children to too many non-words to test phonological awareness mess with their orthographic mapping of words <laughs> if they're violating that CVC representation? Okay, so testing children's phonological awareness using non-words. So are those non-words from a spelling perspective? 
then what you're doing is not testing phonological awareness. You're testing children's ability. They're, you're testing their understanding of letter sound connections. So there surely is a component to letter sounds. Um, and that's what phonics is. So if you are using non-words to test children's phonological awareness, I'm sorry, I didn't spend a little bit more time on the Hugh Katz study. That was a slide in your handout. One of the indicators that he determined to be important in that initial kindergarten uh, screening uh, repertoire was non-word repetition. So there is a phonological component to non-words that can be important. So here's what that would sound like. Tell me this funny word, galoopadop. Your turn. Now, can you match those syllables and the sounds in those syllables to what I just said? You need to hold that word in your phonological working memory and then you need to retrieve it. There isn't any meaning to it, but that is a really strong indicator of how a child's phonological processing system is developing. I'm going to actually add on. I have a question for that, which was going to be later. How do educators support students who really struggle with that phonological working memory? Oh, yes. So when there's that, that's a big one. And you can't teach it. You can't teach phonological retrieval. Work, you can't teach phonological naming. And you can't teach phonological working memory. You can assess them. And so this teacher has assessed, whoa, this memory is really struggling. Now, what the research shows is by building stronger phonological and phonemic awareness skills, that contributes to better naming and better memory skills. Now, if there is a neurologic uh, architectural element where that wiring or the processing, that memory processing system, uh, has some level of weakness and um, the strong foundation is not helping to build it, then we need to move into what special education accommodations need, whether it's some uh, visual supports, uh, movement supports, um, other kinds of accommodations to help facilitate or to contribute to um, a weakness in that memory capacity. Let's see, the other one was for older students, um, so think middle school and up, um, how much time should educators spend, thinking special educators, think tier uh -huh. three, how much time should they spend on those phonemic awareness and phonological awareness activities and tasks? Um, if uh -huh. they're doing, like if they've done um, David Kilpatrick's past or something, um, uh -huh. and they're struggling, how much time do people, should they spend on that? Yeah, really good question. Um, and let me start by saying, how much time should you spend in preschool? Five minutes a day. In kindergarten, kindergarten, first grade, in that instructional, it's recommended about five minutes a day. And what the research says, you know, you get to a point, if you, once you have a skill, then move on. You want to make sure over time monitoring to make sure that skill is in place. But we, you know, some sometimes, and I think part of Part of a concern is that uh, when you spend 20 minutes on a phonological awareness task, you are missing out on other instructional opportunities. And so now that that's what is typical, okay? Once you get to a point where those basic skills are in place and reading and writing is moving forward well, then you generally don't have to teach manipulation tasks because your ability to visualize the orthographic map of a word contributes to your phonological awareness. So for older students where reading has been a big struggle, then what the time factor is, is going to be, I guess the, the best from my own clinical experience, I would say it's gonna depend. What is it that you're working on and what is your goal? What you always want to do in the big picture, um, for older students, you want phonological awareness tasks that are pure phonological awareness tasks, not connected to letters. So you start there, it's kind of a warm up. 
So you do some activities that help build and, and activate the, the phonologic system, and then add the letters, the graphemes to those sound patterns so that now we're moving from, you know, that phonologic piece into phonics. And then beyond phonics, moving into morphemes. So you see syllable patterns and what morphologic connections there may be and what those sounds like. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in some of my own clinical per, uh, uh, ex experiences, I would work on phonological awareness for uh, 15, 20 minutes to help make that pattern consistent and accurate. Here's a, here's a quick story. I was working with a fourth grader, significant phonological processing issues. And I said, uh, say the word pat. And he said, pat. And I said, switch the first sound to the last and the last sound to the first. And here's what he did. Tap. What was he doing? He was visualizing the letters to come up and then to reorder those letters to then read the word. He did not have that capacity to hear that pattern and just do the phonologic piece proficiently. Now, if I were to do that to you, you most likely visualize that word so that you are able to then change the letter forms and then be able to say it. And that's where strong and proficient, good phonological skills and the phonic skills contribute to those manipulation tasks. So we don't really have to teach them children who are already, who, who already have that, who've learned to read and write. So those older students, we want, we want that phonologic system to be developing in a pretty accurate way, in a pretty accurate manner. And so that time piece is going to be related to how many uh, repetitions and accurate practice opportunities does a student need in order to build that foundation? And it has to be accurate. And you build that level of accurate uh, productions to uh, counteract the inaccurate ones that have taken place over a long time. Someone was wondering um, what your opinion was of like the Hegarty program for the phonological awareness, which in, um, also using it for like upper elementary students with phonemic awareness difficulties. Yeah, um, in my experience with Hegarty, I, I, would, I would say Hegarty is a good tier one program. What it does in the early grades is it provides a wide range of, of early to basic to advanced uh, tasks. And it gives children distributed and repeated practice, a lot of practice across an academic year. When you have students who are struggling with the process, they need a program that is sequenced and you build upon skills, you develop a skill and you build upon it and you develop that and build upon it. And Hagerty, um, you could take some of the, the items, the stimulus items that are already provided for you and then pull that. Um, but there are other phonological awareness programs that are going to be um, sequenced in a way that will match students who have underdeveloped skills in this area um, a lot better. All right. Well, that honestly, that is the majority of our questions. We cannot thank you enough. There was so much information. Everyone is incredibly excited to to read the um, the the um, the teaching phonemic awareness in 2023 text, as well as look at your slide presentation. So again, thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. All this information thank you. posted to our website too, so people will be able to get to it within a week. So give us about a week to put it all together and package it, and it'll be on our website. So, right. Thank well, you. let me know if you have questions. It was an honor to share this information with you. Thank you. Thank you. We are spending this time with us. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And for those of you who are still with us, I wanted to make sure you knew that we've got a conference coming up end of 
October. So join us for this two day virtual event um, on October 26th and 27th. And as we delve deeper into the strands of the reading rope. So with the knowledge and extensive background of our esteemed presenters, we'll unravel, explore, my chat keeps popping up, explore, ah! <laughs> each one and discover evidence-based effective approaches. That's sure to be a, a conference that you don't wanna miss if you can make it. And registration is already underway. Uh, early bird fee is $75 for at least 11 CEUs. We're really excited about this and hope you can join us. And to let you know, our next Read for Parents is gonna be um, October 11th. Um, and that's gonna be Morphology with Deb Glazer. And then later in the year, we're gonna have Developmental Language Disorder with Sean Ziggenfus on December 13th. So mark those on your calendar and join us if you can. Thank you so much, Dr. Paulson. A pleasure spending this time with you and I, I learned so much so I, I really appreciate that thank you